I'm here with Bill Priest. He is Chief Executive Officer of Epic Investment Partners and Co-Chief Investment Officer, and it's great to have you back. It's a pleasure to be here, Kim. Thank I, you. I feel as though uh, we've talked a few times, but wow, um, October has sure brought some uh, a different kind of market than the last time I talked to you. What's What do you think is going on? I think there's an inflection point happening in October. Uh, first of all, you've had a slow but sure uh, slowdown in global growth. It, first became visible probably sometime this summer, but as you look at what some few of the pundits were saying, what the IMF has been saying, every time they make a forecast for future growth, it's been from a lower base and a lower rate. Hmm. And I think it all came up in, uh, in the month of October, which is historically a pretty volatile month anyway, if you look at October's in the past. But what the big concern is, I think, is their growth in the real economy. And that is, that is a question mark. When you look at the world as a whole, one of the more disturbing statistics is if you added up total debt, ex-financial debt, and express that debt as a percent of GDP, what you find today is that ratio is higher than it was in 2007. How did that happen? Well, basically uh, what transpired is a lot of the debt that was troubled debt, which existed in the private sector and uh, in the um, um, financial sector had to be moved to some other sector in the crisis, um, and it went to central banks, or so it went to uh, it went to gov the government balance sheets. Uh, long story short, there's four balance sheets that really matter in the world. There's a consumer balance sheet, there's a banking balance sheet or financial balance sheet, there's a business balance sheet, and there are country balance sheets. The mix of that debt shifted, and it was placed on country balance sheets. There was a reason for that. In 08, this was the mother of all liquidity crises, and it was exacerbated by the failure of Lehman, which was probably the single biggest policy error in the United States. Uh, there, that liquidity problem uh, became uh, morphed into what's called a solvency problem, and that led to this recession. Lehman was more than 50% of the other side of letters of credit. And when it failed, the counterparty risk just went through the roof. And no one knew what to do with trade. Global trade almost ceased in its tracks. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, what, what happened was we had a liquidity crisis. You can fix a liquidity crisis with time and money. But there wasn't enough time and there wasn't enough money unless the central banks came in and just flooded the system with credit and money, which they did. Later. And in so doing, what, amount, what they did is shift that debt that was on the bank balance sheets and basically move that, and there was some other debt uh, uh, as well, but mainly what was in the financial system, and put it on the balance sheets of countries, because countries live longer. In theory, countries live forever. Mm -hmm. So the duration of the liability side of a country is infinity, uh, many would argue. That's not true with corporations. In theory, they live forever, but in reality, a lot of them die along the way. So what had happened in that whole process is we moved that debt around. But debt has kept building. So one could argue uh, that the growth we've experienced since 07 08 has been in part financed by the additional growth in debt. But there's nowhere to shift the debt now. There's nowhere to shift the debt now. The trick has always been through QE, through a lot of these mechanisms that, uh, that are consistent with monetary policy, the idea was we would get some the real economy going again. Now, there are only two drivers of the real economy, uh, growth in employment and productivity. So when people talk about real GDP, what they're really talking about is, did we, do we employ more people today than we did before? And are they more productive than they were before? So whatever you think the growth in employment is, plus the growth in productivity, by definition, that's real GDP. If you put inflation on top of that, you have something called nominal GDP. And in the United States, it's pretty clear that we are having a recovery. It's modest, but it is a recovery. That is not clear in Europe, and it's certainly not clear in Japan. Let me ask you, though, because the, the, the and, and tell me if I'm wrong, and I know you will, it seems as though this is not new news. We've known, for example, that China is slowing down. We know that Europe has a problem. We know there's deflationary issues, but it's almost as if in October, the world, or the sellers of the market at least, have, have, have snapped into that? I think the biggest fear is deflation. 
And it's something that most living people haven't had to experience. You have to go all the way back to the 30s to really see it in any broad context. Um, and I think that concerns a lot of policymakers. Um, you'll also see uh, in Germany, for example, uh, you are seeing the rhetoric from that country to be, you've got to do the right thing, you've got to tighten up, you've got to basically go into an austerity mode. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible policy. It'll work for a single country, but not for all. Let's just take, for example, if you and I were a country, two countries, and there might be another dozen people in the room, and let's just pretend they were the world. We are the world and each one of us is a country. If one of us wants to save, lowering our spending, that's not a big deal as long as the others go on their way. But if every single one of us saves, that's a problem because GDP immediately goes down. You cannot save your way to a recovery. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues in Europe is going to be, is Draghi going to be successful at QE? Clearly in the U.S., QE is ending this month, and it's also likely to end in the U.K. But in Japan and Europe, QE is going to continue and arguably accelerate. Uh, if it is accelerating in Europe, which you might have to do, how is Draghi going to do it if Germany and uh, Merkel, who arguably is one of the most uh, visible um, leaders in the free world, um, her aides are suggesting that that's not a good idea. Hmm. Unless Germany backs Draghi, I think it's undoable. So let me ask, uh, and my final question for you, for someone who's watching, and has watched, um, have, has had a great run in the market, um, but they've watched uh, the markets. I mean, TSX was you know, in correction territory. We've seen the U.S. markets uh, sell off. What should they be watching? What should they be thinking in terms of as they manage their money and, and look out to the future? I think the hardest, most people are willing to make a trade. Most individuals are willing to make a trade between capturing less of the upside, but they want more protection on the downside. Uh, it's called an asymmetric return. I don't want to use a word that people are I think everybody with. wants that. Okay. Yep. Most of us would gladly give up. If the market's up 30 and we're up 20, we will be happy as a clam yep. at high tide, as my spouse will say. Uh, but on the downside, when the market's down 20, we want to be down five. Yep. So what investment set of investments will allow that to happen? Well, there are no guarantees, but that's what you're really seeking. Less of the upside, but you really want protection on the downside. So whenever, my, most the outcome isn't going to be a single strategy per se. It's going to be a mix of fixed income, equities, maybe even perhaps some derivatives protect some downside. But that's really what the individual is seeking. And I think they have to work with what are reasonable parameters. So what does that mean? Well, uh, the stock market today has a cash yield of 2%. Um, the U.S. Treasury today hit 2%, actually with under 2 briefly. Uh, your current yield on just about everything in terms of cash is fairly small. Uh, so then you say, okay, do, what do I, how am I going to protect myself against inflation? Uh, and how do I capture productivity growth? Well, you have to own some equities for that. How much depends on what you're trying to achieve. You may also want to capture something to preserve capital. So that's going to be some mix of fixed income, high quality, maybe even some low quality bonds in some respects. It all depends on the individual. But I think the, about the most the individual can expect is if he can capture something today that's in that four to six or five to seven percent, that's probably what the markets offer you. And the, can, and the question is, can you do it in a way where you can live with that volatility? Always great talking to you, Bill. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bill Priest, he is Chief Executive Officer of Epic Investment Partners and Co-Chief Investment Officer. I'm Kim Parley. Thanks for watching.